today I'm going to talk a little bit about element of participating in a clinical trial. And most importantly, I want to um, talk to everybody about the um, why clinical trials have become so important in MPNs, how you can find them, and really a little bit about the nuts and the bolts so that you understand when the right time is to um, enroll in one, what are the things you need to be careful about, and there's a lot of misinformation about clinical trials, and I want to go over that a little bit as well. So why should we discuss this? You know, the number one thing I hear when I talk to a patient about a clinical trial is, well, I don't want to be a guinea pig. Um, I don't want to get um, a placebo drug. And these, in particular, are largely um, myths, and they are ways to kind of, they are some of the barriers that exist in clinical trial enrollment. I see this guinea pig up here, and I uh, think about, we were talking about guinea pigs yesterday at dinner, so it reminds me of something. But um, one of the main things that people also think is that if they are in a clinical trial, they won't necessarily get therapy for their disease, which is not true. Um, and that's an important reason why we need to understand a little bit more about these. So the reasons for discussing this is, of course, there's a lot of misinformation, and that misinformation stems from a long and relatively sordid history of medical experimentation. Um, but the truth is that the more informed you are about the clinical trial, the more likely you are to participate, but also the more you, the the, the more appropriate the trial is for you, the consent process is a very important way to have you understand about your disease and even outside of the clinical trial to understand the limitations of the therapies that we have. So we're going to talk about what a clinical trial is, about oversight, why you should consider participating, and the key things to learn before signing up. So I'll take a little bit of time here to talk about why there's misinformation about clinical trials. As everybody knows here in America, there's been a number of instances where clinical trials were conducted by physicians in an unethical manner. On the right-hand upper corner, we see pictures from the Tuskegee trial, or the Tuskegee study. The Tuskegee study was a study of syphilis, the natural history of syphilis in um, largely health illiterate individuals from the South. And those individuals didn't recognize that during the course of the study, they were not being given appropriate medical care. And in fact, penicillin or other antibiotics that treated syphilis were, were invented and not administered, um, even though it might have helped. And these people were, it was only stopped in 1972. Another example on the left is the Jewett Chronic Disease Hospital, where individuals were um, tested on without their consent or the consent of uh, others. Elder, elderly individuals were used for experiments without consent. And then in the Willowbrook State School, uh, individuals who entered were intentionally infected with hepatitis to study the history of hepatitis in that center. Again, with the excuse that, well, everybody in the center was getting hepatitis anyway, we might as well understand it from the beginning. So all of these leave a legacy of um, very um, disturbing and um, uh, I guess horrific, I might use the word, uh, history. And this is what now has informed a lot of the clinical trial regulations and the rules um, that we abide by, but more important, the ethical obligation that physicians have to be very clear in the dynamics of consent. So what is a clinical trial? A clinical trial or a clinical study is the progression of information that's gathered about an intervention and its outcomes. And usually it starts with preclinical research. You might hear the term investigator's brochure. You might hear the term murine models or mice experiments. And all of that is what, that, what happens before that drug really gets to the patient. Uh, it, it's about understanding how this might work in mice that have, for example, polycythemia vera or myeloproliferative neoplasms. 
it might be understood what that looks like even just on a test on a like on a oops on a petri dish or in a in a bottle that has some cells in it that's preclinical clinical trials are divided into phase 1 through phase 4 and we'll talk about that and then once those clinical trials are completed the Food and Drug Administration makes a decision, sometimes after a phase two study, sometimes after a phase three study, and said, you know, there's a need for this medicine on the market. It should go to market. Sometimes that's, that's all that's said. But sometimes it says, you can go to market, but we need to see some results of some additional clinical trials. So it's almost like a, a probationary period that the drug is approved. So the big thing that clinical trials do is test a hypothesis. Uh, does a new pill prevent spleen growth in patients with myelofibrosis? And that's the overall question that's being asked, but that can't be answered in a single study. The first study has to say, is this pill safe for humans? The second study, which is, that, so that is the pill safe for humans might be the phase one study. Is the pill safe for humans? with individuals with a specific cancer, and what's the right dose? That might be maybe a phase two or maybe a phase 1B study where they're understanding the right dose. And then there might be a study that's just for individuals with a given problem, and that might be this phase two. Do, is there any responses at all? Are there specific toxicities that happen? And usually we think about this in more in the phase two category. A phase three study, which is the one that's typically used by the Food and Drug Administration and the European regulatory agencies to determine whether or not a pill can be sold on the market, is a randomized study. Does this pill work better than what you would otherwise get to prevent spleen growth or to prolong life? And that question of what the end point is, what the outcome is, is right before that question mark. So some studies are are designed to only test the final answer, does this prevent spleen growth, does this prolong life, or something called overall survival. We have a variety of endpoints that are looked at in myeloid cancers when we develop a trial. So these are the phases. And you can see that they all have different sort of points and, and um, it, goals. And the last, which I didn't talk about, are called phase four studies. And these are studies that are done on drugs that have already been approved to either reinforce the earlier findings, to look at different safety, or to look at outcomes that are different than the ones that were tested before. Like maybe there's a approved drug that also might, you know, prevent, uh, uh, mean that you needed less time in the hospital or needed less blood transfusions, but that wasn't part of the outcomes that were tested before. So somebody might do a phase four study to look at that approved drug with these alternative outcomes. So why would you think about participating? So I want people to remember that being in a phase one study is different than being in a phase three study. Phase three studies are randomized, so there is absolutely a chance that you wouldn't necessarily get the new treatment, you might be randomized to the standard of care. So one thing to think about if you're thinking about it in a phase three study is, well, if it doesn't, if I'm not randomized to the investigational agent, will I have a chance to get the real agent? Let's say my disease progresses on the non-investigational agent. Can I, what they call crossover? So one thing when you're thinking about a physical, about participating in a clinical trial is to ask about what is the likelihood that I will get the investigational agent, uh, if not at the very beginning, then later on? Some trials are not are not one to one. Some trials have you randomize two people get the investigational agent for every one person who gets the control arm. The other thing when I talk about a phase three study, I want to talk about is control is not the same as placebo. Placebo doesn't mean we say, okay, see ya. Placebo, or control arm means we'll give you whatever is this current standard of care. It may not be the investigational agent, but we don't know if the investigational agent is better than the standard of care, and that's why the study is being done. So do not mix up the word control with placebo. Sometimes there is a placebo in the control, but it's always in addition to the standard of care. <clears throat> 
Now, being in a phase two study, occasionally these studies are randomized, but they're sometimes randomized to one dose of the investigational agent versus another dose of the investigational agent. So in either way, you would get that investigational agent. Sometimes a phase two study, everybody gets it, but they might get it in a different kind of combination, like one person might get it for seven days in a row, and another person might get it for 21 days in a row. Um, so there's sort of all, the, what the phase two study is looking at is what's the optimal dosing regimen or chronology of getting the medication. Now a phase one study is very important to understand as well. Phase one studies are, are studies that look at the right, at finding the safest dose or the dose that best balances impact on the disease with safety into the individual. So a lot of the people in the phase one study may not get much medicine at all. And that might be almost the same as a placebo. If you're the first person in a phase one study, you're going to get a very tiny, tiny, tiny dose of that medicine. And that may not affect your disease. So questions to ask in the phase one study is, what cohort am I in? That's a sort of medicine slang for, am I the earliest person in the study, or has this study been going on for a long time? Another thing to ask in the phase one study is, will I be stuck at the same dose? Because sometimes the people that get the baby doses are allowed to get more and more and more and more as those doses are proven safe over time. So those are the types of questions that you're going to want to ask when somebody presents you with a phase one, phase two, or phase three study. Phase three study is the most mature drug. Phase one studies are the, the newest ones out of the gate. And there's different kind of uh, subtleties and nuances to being in any of these studies. So what kind of oversight is over these? All studies are overseen by the Food and Drug Administration, sometimes in the sense that there's actual audits that go in and look at everything and every person on the study. But in particular, for the new use of a new drug, the FDA needs to look at the protocol and say, you know, this is a new use in a new in a new patient population, and this seems reasonable and safe. In addition, the hospital where you are getting the drug has oversight over those clinical trials. They have something called an institutional review board and scientific review committees who follow guidelines that have been put out, again, exactly because of those unethical trials we talked about. There's a long set of guidelines that go over what is required of a clinical trial to be safe and worthy for a patient to participate in. And those things are all um, part of the institutional board review and the scientific review committee. There's internal audits. All studies have a, well, nearly all studies have what's called a data safety monitoring committee, meaning that any time um, new medicines are being checked, there's like a, a set of thresholds that the safe, that the study must pass in order to continue on. And the Data Safety Monitoring Review Committee is part of that. Industry has its own monitors and data, data safety. In addition, they distribute on a regular basis all of the events that have happened to the people on the study. And so there's sort of an understanding that people putting you on study might be aware of, well, you know, this caused somebody's um, hair to turn blue back, you know, three months ago, I don't think it's going to happen, but so far three people have been on this study, their hair has turned blue. So that's the kind of things that we keep track of on a dynamic basis. And of course, trials are designed to stop either if there's a problem with safety or they stop if there's a problem and if after a certain number of people there's no effect of the new medicine, that's called stopping for futility. Now there's barriers to participating. Sometimes those barriers are appropriate. If I have disease that's not really affecting me and I don't really need treatment, then I am appropriately concerned about entering a clinical trial for a new medicine if I don't need to be on treatment. So there are appropriate concerns about participating and not all clinical trials are right for the right the one person at any one time. There's also systemic bias. Some trials are difficult to get into if you don't speak English, um, if you don't have easy access to a, an academic center. If you live in northern Wisconsin and it takes you two and a half hours to drive down to see me and you're only allowed 
to go to this trial if you're in Milwaukee, that is a bias that may mean that that trial doesn't really prove that it's the right trial for the greater population. There's misinformation. A lot of people are concerned and not um, aware that trials, um, in, trials are not necessarily designed for the benefit of the person who is entering the trial, but for the benefit of all the people who will learn from that. And that can feel as if that person is being placed in a vulnerable situation, which to some extent the disease has placed them in. Um, and there's also barriers that are protocols, protocols that are written that aren't really appropriate for patients or that exclude too many patients or are written for a very small niche of patients so that the ones that you see can't really maneuver their way into getting it. And then there's barriers that are regulatory. Those are all things that as a community we need to break down so that we can do trials faster, more efficiently, and with patients um, more likely to, the great majority of patients more likely to see the benefits. So when you enter a in a uh, clinical trial, the first thing you go through is informed consent, and we're going to talk about that. And then you're screened, meaning that all of the data about you is matched up to the data required to be in the trial. And if that's a match, then you get enrolled. If there's a randomization, sometimes a coin flip, uh, sometimes a two to one randomization, as we say, and then you're assigned to an intervention. As I say, sometimes you're always on the agent, sometimes you're assigned to one of the control arms or a different investigational arms. And during that intervention, you're monitored for safety, you're monitored for any kind of events that happen. If your hair turns blue while you're taking this medicine, then I, as your doctor, have to say, is that because of the drug or not? And I have to think, well, maybe it is. Maybe I take the drug away for a couple of weeks and your hair goes back to normal. Or maybe I sit down with you and I say, why do you think your hair would turn blue? And you might say, oh, well, I actually went to the hairdresser the other day and she dyed my hair blue. Then I'm not going to blame that on the drug. So that kind of events that occur, I'm in charge of determining how related they might be to the intervention that you're going through or the inter might be related to the disease itself. At the end of treatment, we look at how did this drug do for you? What's the status of your disease? Is it time to stop? We look at the toxicity and the safety, and that's the end of the study. And that occurs, that process occurs for every single person on the study so that at the end of it, we don't just have information about you, we have information about a lot of people who met those enrollment criteria, and we understand whether or not we can test and prove true or unprue that hypothesis that we had at the beginning. Now, informed consent requires four things, disclosure, comprehension, capacity, and voluntariness. These are fancy words, but what they really mean is that I have to be completely transparent with you. That's the first thing, disclosure. I have to tell you what I know and don't know about this medicine. I have to disclose to the best extent that I have how many people have been tested on this medicine. And I have to present to you a consent that includes some background about that. I have to present to you that information in a way that you understand, that's not a lot of jargon, that's clear enough for somebody without a medical degree to be able to take in and make an informed decision. And an informed consent requires disclosure, that's the part about informed, and also consent. Somebody needs to have capacity to make a decision. This has to be something that they have the ability to do. A child cannot give informed consent. Their, their parent can. Somebody who is um, pregnant can give informed consent for themselves, but not necessarily informed consent for the fetus. And therefore, it's very difficult to do clinical trials in individuals who are pregnant. Somebody who doesn't have the mental wherewithal or the uh, mental health to be able to comprehend the impacts on their health does not have capacity. Somebody who's in jail and may have alternative reasons or motivations for participating may not have capacity. That's why there are special um, guidelines for who can participate in clinical trials. And it needs to be voluntary. It can't be coerced. One of the things about the diseases that we treat is that they are life-threatening. And there is a little bit of coercion that comes from the disease itself, where people feel desperate for anything. 
And that's something as a physician I need to mitigate as much as possible so that when people go on this, they understand that many trials are really, not all trials are a home run. Many trials are going to whiff. And so people need to understand that what they're doing is not just for their own personal outcome, but for the understanding of how this, what this, disease, what this agent might do in the greater scheme of things. So during informed consent, we talked about how the trial will be conducted. We talk about what parts are experimental what, versus what parts are the standard of care. We talk about the rights, the risks and benefits, and your rights, can you quit? You know, I always say this is, when I'm presenting a clinical trial, I say, you know, this is not a marriage. We can get you out of this any time. It's not a contract. It's a discussion. And this consent, when you're signing on the dotted line, is not a contract. It's about understanding. And your signature just says, we've talked about this not that you promise me anything. There's testing, and one needs to recognize when you enter a clinical trial, you're also entering a protocol. You're going to come this often for the tests. You're going to let yourself be stuck this often. You might have more MRIs than you otherwise would. And that's also part of your, the, that's part of your participation. Those things will be paid for if they're not standard of care by the study. But it is something that um, you need to understand that you need to, there may be more than your baseline levels of information of, that's gathered. So these are the types of questions that we go over and you should think about when you go through an informed consent. It's also incredibly important to understand it. So if it seems like a morass, take a step back. Say, look, this looks interesting, but I'd like to take it home. I'd like to read it. And then I'd like to have a 30-minute conversation with you by phone or next week in the clinic where I can go over my questions. You should never feel rushed to enter a trial. Screening is done, and this screening period sometimes is 20 to 30 days or so. Sometimes we have to get rid of the prior therapies you're on. We call that a washout. And then we have to make sure that you meet this eligibility criteria. For example, are all these things true about you? And if that's true, then you might meet enrollment. Sometimes the enrollment's not necessarily as um, upfront as we'd like, and sometimes you start and you think you're going to be in a trial, but then you get some tests done and you realize that the, the doctor says, oh, no, I'm sorry, you're not eligible. I don't, I think it's, that's a delicate time. You've kind of gotten yourself, you've gotten your family ready for you to be in this trial, to take this new medicine, and then somebody says, I'm sorry, you're not eligible. So one thing to think about before you get your hopes up about anything is, am I eligible? From what you see now, doctor, do you think I'm going to be able to be in this? Because I do think that one of the things that can drive people away from clinical trials is this uh, being too restrictive during this screening period. You might also understand a little bit about what the procedures look like. This is a common type of map we might use. What happens during screening between S and C1? C1 starting for cycle one. What would happen then? When would I need to meet with the investigator? When would I need to get a bone marrow biopsy or imaging done? And this type of map is helpful to go over because and indeed, if you live 400 miles away from your center and you have to drive in to get there, you might say, well, I'm going to need to plan on staying locally this period of time. Can somebody help me with that? Where would I stay? You know, um, those kind of questions need to be answered before you begin so that you're not trapped in a relatively cumbersome plan before you know it. And it needs to be weighed against the risks, uh, against the benefits of being in it. In a clip, clip, typical clinic visit, we would, of course, do a history and sometimes a physical exam. We would look at your test results for the day. I would go over what kind of adverse events you might have had, and I might grade those or discuss with you whether or not I think they're related to the medicine, related to the disease, related to progression of the disease. Maybe the medicine's not working well enough. Then we would talk about the dose of the study drug. How should we balance it? And finally, we might do response assessment. How well is this working? Those are sometimes done at very important period intervals during the trial. The end of treatment, we, if you're still showing clinical benefit, you would stay on it. 
Sometimes people are allowed to stay on medicines even after the trial ends if it's continuing to benefit them. And that might be something you ask about right at the beginning of the trial. If I'm benefiting, can I stay on even after the trial ends? Sometimes people come off because their disease progresses or the protocol says if your disease progresses, you have to stop. Sometimes there are side effects that are intolerable. Um, a patient of mine on a clinical trial developed atrial fibrillation because of that clinical trial drug. And he, the atrial fibrillation was not severe, but because of that atrial fibrillation, he needed to be on two additional heart medicines and an anticoagulation. And we decided after weighing the risks and benefits, you know, it's not worth being on this trial drug because now you're on four additional medicines and we have alternatives. So that's the kind of plus minuses that we do every clinic visit. Is it still worth it for you to be on this medicine? Sometimes people come off because they just don't want to be on it. You know, doc, 400 miles is just too much for me to come every two weeks. That's something that we'd like to avoid by talking about it before the trial starts or by figuring out ways to have you stay locally, for example. But those are the types of things that you want to think about. You want to think about the end of the treatment before you even start. So how can you get engaged? Like I talked about, I think carefully reviewing the consent form, asking somebody else to read it with you, come up with questions. Again, somebody who's not necessarily looking down the barrel of the, of the, of the disease, somebody who doesn't feel as threatened by the disease might be in a better space to ask questions. You want to clarify whether or not you can stay on the medicines that you're already on. Um, you want to make sure that you are able to adhere to all the requirements of the study and the schedule. Once you're in the study, you can tell us about anything. You know, doctor, my hair turned blue. Uh, doctor, I'm itchy. Um, I'm wondering if this vomiting is due to the new medicine or due to the oyster dinner I had last night. Those kind of things are things we need to know because what we want to do is be overly anxious to report everything that might be related to the new drug. Um, and then you're definitely going to keep a diary of how you are, advocate for yourself, and also assign family members to come to, or loved ones to come to meetings with you to advocate for you as well. You want to talk about the financial considerations. Who pays for the study drug? Who pays for the other drugs I'm going to need to take to be on that study? Um, what are the considerations? In general, a study should not be more expensive than the standard of care for you. And if it is, you should talk about that very carefully with your doctor before entering because there should not be a financial cost to being on the study. And that is also important to talk about if you have to travel 400 miles, are lodging expenses or travel reimbursed by the people conducting the study? Um, can I do these locally, for example? Those are all important considerations to take into account. Now, some things, other things to ask, open label, that means you're going to know what medicine you're getting, right? It's not blinded. Whereas if it's single or double blind, meaning you will not know, you might be getting the investigational medicine or you might be getting a sugar pill plus the standard of care and you won't know which one you're taking, for example. Placebo controlled is when Again, there is a sugar pill that you get in addition to the standard of care so that people can stay blinded to the intervention. And like I talked about, crossover design means that if you're on a, the, the arm that doesn't have the investigational agent, you can move over if need be. So there's a lot of resources out there to talk to you about clinical trials, to help you find one clinicaltrials.gov, which I've listed here, um, as well as the MTN Education Foundation and the Research Foundation, all give you some references for how to access clinical trials. In the MPN community, as you well know, patient support and patient communities are very strong. And they can also point to the, some of the new clinical trials that are coming out. Over the course of the day, you're going to hear a lot, about a lot of studies those studies are the results, those results and graphs that you're going to see up here. Those are the results of the clinical trials that people before you have participated in. And the reason that we know a lot about MPNs, the reason that we have new medicines, is because people participated in clinical trials. And yourself and others like you can help drive this forward 
with a good, transparent, honest, and realistic conversation with your doctor about clinical trials.